Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Mitten Backstage. Hope you're doing well. Today, I'm chatting with Brandon Copeland. Now, a lot of you might know Brandon from around the Grand Rapids scene. He is involved in so many different projects, from his own personal work under Dante Cope, to Les Creatif, to Wimcat, to you know, running underground shows, throwing in, you know, DIY venue parties. Like he's done a lot of stuff. We talk all sorts of things from some of our past shared experiences around the GR scene to his experience in the DIY underground scene, making, you know, all sorts of things happen from behind the scenes to being a teacher, being a, you know, kind of a out of the box performer, uh, you know, not being pigeonholed to one style or genre or even an instrument so he's a multifaceted dude and it was fun getting to chat with him if you like today's episode and you want to contribute to the podcasts that i produce you can head on over to patreon.com slash there you can support at different tier amounts to get early access to the audio and video versions of each podcast exclusive merch and more Also, becoming a patron isn't just about you getting content early, it's about showing your support for artists in general, because Patreon is a great way to help artists, especially post-COVID, supplement their income and continue to create and grow as artists and people in the artistic spaces that they occupy. You can also head over to DutchSeneca.com to see everything else that I'm currently up to on the internet. I recently updated my touring page to show some fall shows that I have for the month of October. So if you're in the area, come check it out. October 9, uh, I will be with Earth Radio and the Go Rounds at Northern Natural. So hopefully I'll see you there. If you also want to support this podcast, you know, sharing, liking, subscribing, any way that you normally interact with a piece of content on the internet uh, helps me a lot. You know, all this talk of the algorithms and feeding them as creators, it's very tricky to navigate. Things change at the drop of a hat. So your ability to just share to your friends, like, you know, follow regularly, you know, get updated and post about things that you like watching that helps all creators so that's a great thing to do too all right let's get into today's chat with brandon copeland it's very very like simple right now and i'm sure we'll add like little textures but (laughs) nice yeah yeah i've just been making their tones um yeah our stuff is always like dark and like weird so <laughs> there's a lot of dark and weird tunes, new dark and weird tunes coming up so right um, actually i want to talk to you about the uh the helen lyle track the one oh but um yeah that one she's gonna release it soon um she's been like slowly releasing stuff for like her se- second project which is like i would say like 60 percent done 70 percent done um, okay it's a little more focused than like her first project just as far as like kind of going a different route less like hip-hop beats and just more like psych rock type stuff oh cool so it's been nice yeah, yeah. nice little uh i don't know i guess you work with her enough where it feels more like i would say side project but it's like she's part of the what you do i guess if i'm thinking of the right person yeah. um actually no I'm not uh, the right person. <laughs> no that's don for the most part but like don like helen kind of just came about she was looking for a producer um oh okay friend of hers at work i had done stuff for with, with um her style her sound is like really like almost like a throwback it's like sort of like beth Gibbons with like a little bit of bjork okay um so she kind of has like a unique voice um which sort of trip hop but yeah it's nice. nice um yeah we actually 
I don't have, I have one song with her um, outside of like stuff I've produced for her. Um, and that's actually going to be released soon, uh, Halloween. So that's going to come out on Halloween. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is the season for <laughs> just putting work into creative stuff. I, I feel like my summer schedule, there's, there's remnants of it in terms of like, you know, there's some weddings I'm still playing this month and there's like, you know, I'm still running around, but as it's starting to get colder, the running around is like, it's not like, Oh, go here. And then there. And it's like, all right, we're going to go like today is like, I went to Mark's house and we just spent like four hours just working on stuff. And now I'm home. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm not driving <laughs> all over the state, <laughs> but that's, yeah. Like yeah. yeah yeah like last month we had a ton of shows um this month kind of just like sitting back more just like recording um <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's just like i think last month i had like probably like eight eight performances okay which like for me is a lot like just because i also teach <laughs> and then i also right. like yeah it's just I'm like, yeah, getting a little burnt out. So let's, let's turn it back. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I can't even <laughs> think of the people who have, you know, like a bunch of um, like reschedules from last year. And I was, you know, talking to some of the people who are more on the producing end, but also perform of um, within Blue Water Kings. And one of the guys out of Chicago was like, oh, yeah, there's like, you know, 700 reschedules <laughs> across <Yeah. laughs> the board. And like he's he was doing like four to six gigs a week for like, you know, <laughs> months. <laughs> just yeah, it's insane. <laughs> it, like that schedule is just crazy. Um, yeah, I think like doing performances uh teaching and producing in between all of that so it's been like a month of a productive month of good music right but i like, want to finish up a bunch of projects so like october is like let's finish up a bunch of projects we have like music videos in the works and all of that type of stuff so it's like getting all of that done um because like when you're on the road or if you're just doing a bunch of shows it's really hard to do all of that <laughs> like at the same time um planning stuff <laughs> yeah everybody's yeah. schedules is crazy um like pretty much everybody in our band like they're in different bands as well so it's mm -hmm. like um i'm pretty sure like like justin did a few solo shows last month um hugo plays with a bunch of different people so it's yeah <laughs> it's just there yeah and one even like i think of the people who just you know trying to make small talk that aren't musicians and they were you know they were asking you know like oh do you guys got gigs coming up or like where can i go see you next and <laughs> you know there's some stuff in the books but to try and explain like yeah you know this is still a weird time like you might be able to have the convenience of walking into a place and seeing music but so many you know like the whole weird cobbled together system of of the music industry was all like all over the place like people you know who were booking at for a place they're not there anymore or that place that had music doesn't have music and you know people are still parsing out like what's still around or what started like new places have popped up and <laughs> yeah all over the place <laughs> Yeah, it's been, like, I kind of took the opportunity to kind of just, like, start with a clean slate. So, like, started with some open mics um, just to get back in the swing of, like, doing shows again. Um, and then, like, put some shows at, like, the normal places we play at. Um, but it was also, like, we had a bunch of opportunities that were, like, not our traditional like opportunity like we did a grandpa's chamber show um which was like cool 
<laughs> but also just weird because it's like they're bringing in people that aren't really like there to listen to the music <laughs> right it's just like uh, you know this is what the city has to offer it's like a tour and it's like yeah and i'll play <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and like i said we play dark and weird stuff so like <laughs> it's just like you guys are in for a trip you guys yeah are in for a trip. well and i'm <laughs> sure like you know because I, I feel like that happens sometimes with earth radio where like people don't know what we do and they hire us for like a thing that we take. Cause it's like, Oh, it's, you know, we got that Friday open or something. And then somebody's, you know, gets upset that like we did something or like we were too loud. And it's like, did you listen yeah. to any of our music <laughs> before hiring us? <laughs> we definitely get the too loud. We definitely get like, I didn't think it was going to be this intense or this <laughs> political. <laughs> uh we get a lot of that it's just weird like it's weird that like when people book shows they don't actually listen to the music <laughs> that's what's weird to me yeah it's just, so weird <laughs> yeah it's, it's just like if you i have the saying that like um they pay you uh what you can't do not what you can do so like unless they say like you can't jump off of the speakers or like you know be loud <laughs> yeah like if they want us to be quiet they could pay us more we'll be quieter but we're gonna do our set how we normally do it until yeah they tell us otherwise but contracts mm -hmm. <laughs> so contracts <laughs> if they tell us we need to be quiet we'll be quiet and yeah right but, yeah, it's so like, it's it's funny when I get the inverse too, where like people want, you know, they they want to hire, like I, I'm doing a background music gig at the end of the month for like a, I think it's like a convention or something. I don't know what it's something at DeVos Center, and you know, I'm I've done that before where you know it's like oh, there's a bunch of people, they're all there to see you know businesses and booths and network, and then I'm just in a corner. And they walk past and some of them do the like, yeah, good. that sounds like music. And they keep going. And yeah. <laughs> and this person, they like went through, they went through, uh, you know, uh, like a friend who knew me and then recommended me for the thing. So it's like, okay, this person went through someone they trust to then hire someone they, you know, yeah, that made sense. But then they still, the person planning everything still wanted like, oh, could you send like a sample of like what you do? I'm like, <laughs> do you want to yeah. look at my website? I don't, like your friend recommended exactly <laughs> what you wanted, but you're still skeptical. <laughs> yeah. I think like, <laughs> I don't know, people are, have this idea in their head of what they want for music and they have a hard time explaining that yep. to like the people they're hiring. And it's also like, this, that's part of it. The other part is just like, if you want like something fun and something cool or something like, leave that to the professor though. Like that's what you're hiring that person to do is to bring that. <laughs> like, as long as you can tell them the vibe or whatever you want, it's up to the musician to bring that. Um, but most of the time people don't like have that vision of what they want. Like, well, what do you actually want? <laughs> and most of the time it's just like i want background music or the, you know i want this i want that it's just yeah i feel like like parties you know booking something like playing for dinner or something like that the whoever's booking it should be intentional on what they, what they want yeah. yeah it's like it's funny how people can understand like it's like you don't go to Michael's to buy plumbing equipment. Like not every store is a Walmart. <laughs> and, you know, some musicians can be multi-dimensional and multifaceted and serve multi-purpose functions. But, you know, if you're hiring a band that usually comes with like, here's what we do and here's what we sound like. And, you know, there's somebody's it puts in their bio, like, we're kind of like this band and this band 
So if you like this band and then people are still like, I don't, should we hire this rock band for my, you know, <laughs> my uh, baby showers? <laughs> yeah. Our, our band is weird. It's like we cross genres a lot. Um, so like some people will book us as a jazz band and then realize we're not jazz <laughs> or they'll book us for like a rock show or a hip-hop show and they're just like well y'all do a little bit of all of that at some point in the set but <laughs> it's like I tell people we're just like a like a funk rock band that's right. the best way to describe it it's just like you know we're like a derivative of like parliament and <laughs> that that yeah <laughs> so there's going to be some rock elements. There's going to be some heavier elements. There's going to be some, like, you know, jazzier stuff, smooth stuff. It Like, we like to take people on a journey. So it's just like, enjoy the ride. <laughs> we'll, drop you off, we'll drop you off at a safe point at some pl- point in the set. But we want you to feel, so- we want you to feel something. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. Yeah, I and think that, it... Oh, go ahead. That, <laughs> If what you're feeling is anger, then <laughs> we still made you feel something, <laughs> but that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as long as, you know, uh, there's some sort of reaction that we've done our job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, and I think of someone like, you know, Chris Dave running the drum heads and it kind of being a like a, a genre jumping playlist and yeah he always at the top of the set will say like you know it's like you're digging through records at a record store and you're like sampling a little bit from each and then i feel like he like i don't know if it's intentional or if he um just it's out of habit he does it but there are times where he uses that like snare the side snare with like a delay uh and it's almost like a DJ doing like, you know, they're like coming to yeah. the end of something and then they cue in, you know, a tag or some sample. Yeah, a little <laughs> echo out. Yeah. yeah. And it's like that, you know, whether or not people pick up on that kind of thing, it's like, oh, he's he's doing the thing that he said in a very simple sentence, but there's a lot of ways, you know, yeah. to get that across. <laughs> I think like just the way people consume music nowadays, it's like people listen to a bunch of different stuff. So like as artists, like we can do all of that and jump genres just because that's the way people listen to stuff now. It's just like, you know, I'll put on Spotify or whatever, go from jazz record to hip hop record to some heavier rock like Lice or like, you know, different bands. And then, you know, come back full circle. It's just like whatever is it, whatever mood you're in at the time. Um, and I just feel like artists are starting to do that now. Just like different bands are starting to do that. It's like, you know, we're not technically one genre. We kind of can jump around. Yeah, yeah. and it's you know, it, it it's like some people can. I don't know, express that fluidity. I, I feel like sometimes, you know, like the word jazz can get thrown around a lot and it's like, okay, but where, like, where are you coming from with it? Are you, is it because you learned, you know, some extended harmonies? Like that doesn't necessarily mean jazz, but maybe you learned them from yeah. a jazz song. And, you know, not to say that like people can't subscribe to jazz, but it's, and even jazz as a term is like starting to it's like black american music is like the umbrella term for <laughs> like yeah. a bunch of styles <laughs> now when you say jazz it scares people it all comes from a, it all comes from a place it's so like you know you can't like for most of our stuff it comes from like bitches brew miles davis era type stuff it's just like yeah let's like do something weird with the electric guitar and the sax but like that could be just a segment in a song, whereas like the entire song is not jazz as like the genre. It's just like, no, we just like have this part and 
Um, you know, it's just taking like I'm a hip hop kid, so like for me it's like sampling, but like we're just playing it. So it's just like I take a little sample of like this, take a little sample of this, take a little sample of this, put it all together, and you kind of just create your own genre at that point. But it's like instead of like actually going sampling the records, we're just like playing it or just making up our own stuff. It, that's that's usually like how I look at music. It's just like I have like a vibe that I want to, you know, have, and then I write within that. So it's just like, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna. This song is gonna be moody, and it's gonna be dissonant, and then like that's just the idea, um, and then I like take cues from like just inspiration from like pretty much any anything. Like I'm a big Bowie fan. Bowie to me is like genres just clash <laughs> like throughout most of his music. It's just like I found something new that I like. Now I'm gonna put it into the music. <laughs> and you know, now I'm not classic rock anymore. I'm doing this. Oh, I heard about Trent Reznor, so now I'm gonna do like yeah, Freight of Americans <laughs> and just like <laughs> jump into different genres. And then like even like later it was like the black star album it's like yeah that's inspired by kendrick lamar and it's just like if you don't listen to it you don't like hear it because people are just like how <laughs> and it's like nah he you know some of the techniques they use in the album yeah there's there's a but that is like how i approach like writing uh like in lake creative we have like me don and trav do most of the writing so it's like they have different styles than i do <laughs> so right. it, it's cool like to mash them all together it's like sometimes like trap writes the whole thing sometimes like we all write together sometimes i write the whole thing sometimes don writes the whole thing so it's like um we're kind of just like blending all of our styles together and see where everybody fits yeah, it, the, the the happy compromise with a lot of creative people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it's kind of that way in Earth Radio, where like we've everyone in the band, aside from David, since he's newer. Um, I mean, David, you know, contributed percussion and and other additions to parts on the sessions we just did, and everyone else in the band you know, from when it first started to now um, has contributed something. Um, and the main songwriters are Justin and Hannah, but even between them, it's like very different, like different perspectives, even though they're both kind of coming from like writing very like, I don't know, not folksy, but like, like human it like hu human feeling music whether it's like soul or like you know a funk starting point and then they'll jump around take inspiration from other sounds other styles and then we kind of have to come together on like oh yeah i like this layer but what if we did it this way or i like this we have like you know <laughs> with this record we we just did uh <laughs> like in the mixing process there's so many like we have a um a bunch of takes where while we were taking the dry takes there was a separate wet channel and it was just you know the guest producer Paul Clemson was like manipulating all the pedals while everything was being tracked that we didn't hear and then now we just have you know like an hour of <laughs> like just sounds and like where did that go? let's put that here and like where how did he is that the piano like where did he so it's it's nice to have like a band where any idea goes but then we also can kind of trim away at like what might be too much or too little for the the feel we want um so it's not just like you know uh an abrasive symphony or like some somebody's master's yeah. thesis like here's i wrote a piece <laughs> about this giant word that i translated <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah 
Yeah, we do that too. I was like going through some sessions and it's like, we'll have 120 tracks. We're only using like 30 of them. <laughs> it's just like all oh, these other tracks that like were just alternate takes or like, you know, a different idea that we didn't even use. There was like one of our songs, Row, like originally had a different hook altogether that we had recorded. And then it was just like, uh, I like Trav's hook better. <laughs> so then it was just like we jumped into that one. We're like, we're using that as a hook for the song. Uh, yeah, it's just like all of that, like, I, I love it. It's just like we can bounce around ideas, add stuff, take out a lot of stuff. Cause that's what we mo mainly do is just like, let's take this out, this out, this out, <laughs> this out. <laughs> and then like strip it, strip it down to like, to me, like, if you could play, a song like acoustically and then play with all the bells and whistles, but it's a good song. Like if you could do both back and forth, cause it's just like, that's, I usually like to like, I'll like build a song, you know, add a bunch of layers, boom, 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 boom. And then like at the end, if I can like just play it with just like piano and voice or like guitar and voice. And if it's still a good song, that's how I like <laughs> do my creative compass work. Like, oh yeah, that's a good song. Let's keep it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I think too, with, you know, when we put out a record, we know that there's going to be the recorded version and then a live version with like, you know, it's like, Oh, we only got four people realistically. What can these four people do? And that's why like everyone in the band has some blend of like, you know, they're playing an instrument, half the band singing, but then everyone's got effects of some kind or like a sample pad or, you know, something extra yeah. to kind of, you know, somebody's triggering something and you're like, where is it coming from? <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, it's fun kind of, or even a band like, you know, watching Hiatus Coyote's Tiny Desk and like what they were able to pull off with really just the only additional band members were the, the singers they tour with. And I think one of them played a little bit of keys, but it was just yeah. drums, bass, and then different keyboards, and then Napalm sometimes playing guitar. <laughs> yeah. And there's just this cool blend of texture to each each track, even though there was only four people doing stuff. <laughs> yeah. No, that's like we kind of kind of stick into our, stick to our roles. It's more like drums, bass, guitar um and then me doing something weird on every song whether it's either sax keys or guitar um and then there's like but i mean like hugo as a drummer fills up a lot of space he has like a bunch of all the percussion <laughs> yeah all, all the percussion yeah so that kind of like fills up a lot of the space and then we have like Justin as a guitar player. We kind of just let him do his thing. <laughs> it's just like at <laughs> practice, he's like, every song I play different. And we're just like, <laughs> he has a good ear and like, he just like zones out. He'll just add like layers of like goodness. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it's like usually like, me like lately we've have a lot of our new songs i'm playing guitar so it's basically just me like holding down like just the rhythm or like a set <laughs> pattern um and then like letting everybody else kind of bounce around that and then like vocally between the three of us yeah like the vocalist change that's always been weird like doing live just because like uh sound guys are always like who's your main vocalist <laughs> head up monster it's not like lead singer backup singer it's, it's just like <laughs> we all are just turn all of our mics up yeah, yeah. We'll handle <laughs> it. but uh it's it's always weird with that just because like but usually we'll turn my mic up more than everybody else and like lately i've been doing less of like the vocal carrying of and stuff it was just like yeah you might want to have everybody's mic up 
because <laughs> yeah. we are, yeah. But it's been it's been nice. Yeah. Late, late lately, it's been like so with COVID and all of that, music venues reopened. There. I noticed that a lot of music venues fired their sound people. I am one like, of them. <laughs> <laughs> and and now all these venues, the sound sounds terrible. <laughs> and I'm just like, it's maybe that's something like you should have kept around if you're gonna still do music. <laughs> Because, yeah, you can't have all these shows. It's just, like, sounding bad. Uh, so that's been, like, yeah, sort of a little pet peeve. Yeah, because then it always it always falls, you know, it always falls on the, you know, the artist or, like, you know, somebody who's not related to how the front of house should sound anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know i think of like with founders doing the like the patio shows they've been like contracting steve leaf and morgan and i'm like hey uh just give morgan that job again if he wants it yeah. <laughs> and he can build another team like th th there's you know i don't think places realize how valuable a, a sound person that like has put in a lot of time and effort into making a space, you know, like com comfortable enough for people to like see shows in. Um, yeah. And then just trying to like pass it off to like, oh, you, you got, you got Bluetooth headphones. You like music. And you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you could probably do it. <laughs> yeah. It's either that or I see like a lot of like studio engineers trying to do live sound. And there's a difference. <laughs> like, there's a huge difference. Like, especially like if you're not comfortable with the space or like the venue itself, um, like you can't just like subcontract somebody and bring them in. Mm -hmm. um, and then like an hour before the show and just be like, hey, let's do a quick soundtrack or line check and then throw the like a six piece band on. Doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just, yeah. Uh, but I mean, like, there's, like founders, for example, like they invested a lot, like before COVID, pre-COVID, yep. into like their sound. Like when they first opened, their sound was terrible. The space setup was terrible. It was just like, you know, long hallway. They put like the dampeners in the. They ended up putting the dampeners in like the ceiling and like the japes along the window, so it doesn't just like bounce around. Yeah, <laughs> it's not like an echo chamber. So like. You know, a few years later, like, they're one of the better sounding venues. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's just like a lot of venues don't invest the time or the resources into doing that. And just like having, you know, a uh, front of the house mix and then like a stage mix where like the band can hear what they want to hear, like, and the audience can actually hear what's going on. Uh, I think most venues, they just turn it up really loud. I hope they just blow out everybody's ear so nobody notices. <laughs> they can't so. yell at us if they can't hear it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. It's, it's also like, it's funny because I, you know, having an office at Third Coast, um, there's, I definitely want and should and should probably just dive right into like, you know, getting used to like turning on the SSL, you know, recording stuff, routing things to different places just to get used to how that, I mean, I get an idea of how it's all set up, but it's, it's very comprehensive. But when I was asking, uh, Bill, uh, Bill Chrysler who owns the studio. Um, I was like, how does it, how does live sound compare to studio sound? And he's like, well, if you're coming from live sound to studio, it's way easier because you're going from, yeah like a dynamic environment that's always changing and you're always having to adjust based on, you know, the, the style in the room or how many people, or, or even if you're, you know, contracted out and you just do sound at different spaces, indoors and outdoors, your, your ears are having to work to hear certain things versus, you know, getting used to a studio space and not realizing like, Oh, your monitors are mounted wrong. So you're missing some of the top end. Cause all you're hearing is, <laughs> you know, yeah. a, a part of your mix or, you know, oh, you, you're, 
you're literally just, you know, you're doing it in your basement, which is fine, but you're used to a basement <laughs> versus like, yeah. I don't know, trying to mix on the fly like that instead of being able to like sit there and like, okay, I know this room's tuned. Let's EQ things in and out, you know, take an hour to <laughs> EQ yeah. like one track or something. <laughs> you, you can, yeah, it's like the being in the, because yeah, he did live sound for decades. So he's very much aware <laughs> of like, yeah, it's way easier to not have to think about yeah. playing in an amphitheater or like a stadium or <laughs> somebody's backyard. Like yeah. it's just a room <laughs> that's ready to use. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I feel like, I do feel like a lot of the studios here, I've actually, like, recorded or played in a bunch of them here. And, like, a lot of them are pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of, I think, uh, Amberlit, I've done a bunch of stuff with them. Yep. Um, uh, Dogtown, mm -hmm. recently, like, that was nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. River City, obviously, yeah, <laughs> probably one of the best best in the city. Yeah. Uh, Audio Bay, uh, like, I used to do stuff out there a long time ago, but he's still kicking and doing doing great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's just like a lot of the new stuff, like a lot of like creative stuff, we recorded ourselves. Um, I have like a five hundred series setup. Nice. It works decent for what we're doing right now. It saves time and money. And like, if I have an idea, I can just go and lay it down rather than like wait, <laughs> practice it out, or just like do some rough stuff. Um, and it's like my setup is mobile too, so I can like set up in different rooms. Mm. Um, I made it mobile because like I was on the road a lot. And, uh, like when I was on the road, I was like, I don't need to record like at some point you know <laughs> i would need to record uh and i'll just like bring like a little roll case with me and then like can do whatever i want i have a bunch of different mics mm -hmm. um but i think like doing it that way or the way we've been doing it um we're also trying to like use our setup so like if or when we go on tour, depending on COVID, right. um, we have all our stuff and we can just like continue to work and record and do music on the road. Yeah. Uh, That's kind so of the smart way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it doubles as like our like effects box too. So like we can run our microphones in there for vocals and things like that and get like all the extra extra stuff that we need <laughs> uh <laughs> in a lot in a live performance um but we're still kind of testing that out so it's been like yeah yeah i've definitely seen like i've seen you know like certain bands that have you know if if they buy the the stuff to have the infrastructure they get like a you know like a p16 and they run all their in-ears and then just run lines out from there to the house and i've also seen other times where i think of a, a show i i worked at founders where it might have been like a harvest party or something um because i think it had like four artists and one of them was like i can't remember i think his name was steven something it, it wasn't Williams, but he was like related to like the Hank Williams lineage in some way. And, you know, had a good voice, but um, his, <laughs> it, whoever he hired to bring, uh, you know, insisted on running, li literally it was just, you know, vocals, guitars, and tracks. And he wanted to run it all through his Ableton setup to get a multi-track recording and then send it out to us. And we were like, we could take, you know, it's like four lines. Yeah. We could just take that and like multi-track it ourselves. Like we already do that. And, <laughs> and they were like, no, no, we got it. And like, we were noticing like things were like cutting out and like weird, you know, digital hiccups. And then yeah. after the last song, everything just like 
was like it shut down <laughs> oh yeah and we were just like we tried to <laughs> so, yeah it's just like at that point it's just like most digital mixers now have like where you could just put plug a usb in you can record straight from like the mixing console and the mm -hmm. live menu so it's like yeah <laughs> yeah it, yeah I, I don't know it's well and i think of like whenever we would have guest engineers they they like i, I remember a couple it might have been the guy who was touring with like the infamous string dusters um i think they had their own sound but it, it was a dude who literally like you know he introduced himself and then he comes over and then was like i know you guys have a digital board but like which one is it and we're like oh the m32 and he opens up this little case and there's like a bunch of thumb drives with like presonus and like m32 x32 like he had just yeah. made mixes on a bunch of yeah. different boards <laughs> and just plugged that's, it in loaded the scenes and it was great yeah that's the way to do it <laughs> it's <laughs> is that and like even like going from live to just like recorded audio like when I used to record bands and stuff and they have a, you know, major label bands and stuff, they would already have all of their stuff. Like, <laughs> these are the compressors we use. This is <laughs> the stuff we use. Like, can you do that? <laughs> like, load all those presets in. They already have it for their voice. So they sound the same every time, no matter what studio they're recording in. It's just like, I think every artist should do that. And like, especially like, in the recording, like every studio should do that in the recording session, like save that, you know, a template for that singer or template for that guitar player. So, you know, like every time they come in the studio, they have, you just plug and play, boom, you know, this is Dutcher's, what he likes for piano, what he wants to hear. <laughs> right. <is> there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all the buses are there. Yeah. Um, I know it's like a lot of studios don't really do that. <laughs> They'll just like do that per song, but like then they're starting blank new again. And it's like, or like maybe for like an album, and then the next album comes through and it's just like, no, nothing saved. <laughs> or like nothing's, no presets are saved for the first time. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and that's why, I, you know, if I've just watching Kevin, how Kevin and Bill work, and even when, you know, Joe Hedinga was there watching him work a little bit. Um, before I had an office and uh, seeing like, you know, like Jake Kershaw is recording his album right now. And, you know, I'll walk into studio a and it won't just be like, Oh, it's his guitar and an amp. It's like, Nope, all the amps are out <laughs> and yeah. they're all, you know, there's enough mics to like have a basic, like, okay, we're going to, you know, we might need to move Switch. a mic over to another amp, but, it's really easy to just be like, Oh, try the Marshall. Oh no. Try the Fender twin. Try the, like, there's no, yeah. it's not like, yeah, we, you know, it's, it's not like he starts with one thing and they're like, well, now we got to go get this and set it up. And it's like, Nope, <laughs> yeah. we're giving you the yeah. options right now. <laughs> they're all ready to go. <laughs> um, or yeah. even with, you know, earth radio, I don't, it'll be interesting to see how we do the next album. Cause we, I think Kevin even took a picture of it. Like all the the TT cable routing on the SSL, everything was just like every channel was being used, and it's just this <laughs> mess of cables. And I'm like, I I know it's all going places, but like I can't keep track of where where the chains are all going. And um, I'm glad that you know having another set of ears there and another producer mind to be like, oh well, instead of you know taking a vote like oh you want effects on the vocal from this pedal instead of you know routing a tt to quarter inch yeah. and then back into a, a board it's you know just a sends from like a wet channel through an aux sends or something yeah and yeah just it's i that i remember learning sound just in a, a church environment kind of in a <laughs> It was like a six hour training and they're like, all right, your first service is on Sunday. I'm like, all right. <laughs> and having to like, you know, get used to like, before they fixed everything, um, all the routing was all over the place. It was like, nothing was one-to-one. -one. It was like, 
oh yeah, fader one controls channel five and that goes in at six on the stage <laughs> and it's in the it's you know number eight on the p16 or something yeah that's <laughs> you're like i, I can't bet it's a it. <laughs> yeah i bet it's a terrible situations like that like <laughs> it was like a while ago this is a long time ago um but fountain street church was trying to like i had a recording company and they hired our recording company to do their services and they also wanted us to revamp their like systems that they had because uh, they used to do bands and stuff in like the 80s right and then they stopped for a while and they had all this equipment <laughs> so like we have to go through it all <laughs> like inventory it all but then they like had a lot of stuff that was like hardwired through the building that was like still plugged in oh. like yeah <laughs> having to figure out like where this overhanging mic that's been up there for the past 25 years doesn't work, A, <laughs> and like, B, what's it wired to? Because it's like, you know, into the ceiling and like, don't know where it goes. So we had to figure all of that out, uh, which is also like scary because we had to go all the way up to the top of the cathedral on this like little harness and like shimmy uh, the ceiling to pull that mic through. And then wow. Like, yeah. <laughs> it was they had some like really old school like ribbon mics that were like in pretty pristine condition um they had a pretty good setup but it was just like wi wired crazy when going into the mixer and stuff like that too so uh ended up redoing all of that and uh i ended up leaving like the recording company around that time so I think uh, there was like two guys, Travis and Dave, that ended up finishing up that job. Um, yeah. I was yeah. Like, I, I, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> this is not what I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although but it was, uh, uh, it was, it was fun. Like it was fun at the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I was just thinking like you, with all the different, not just ex i guess experiences but like the the nature of like whether you're creating something or you're doing some sort of job um because you also teach at wimcat and it's it's like a lot of that stuff i feel like is is great for being able to teach someone like no you know like sound isn't like it's not always two plus two equals four you know it's like yeah. okay is is two even there and I think that's two and we're at seven. So that that's weird. Let's figure yeah. out how to even that out. Um, but has, has that been, is, is that back to being more in person or like, did that just. Yeah, we're back in person full time now. And it's been nice. Cause like, um, have you been in the building? Yeah. Uh, once it's been probably since 2019 or something. So like my classroom um we have like the main classroom and then there's like a small booth like soundproof room uh so we can do like recordings and things like that uh but i got to like design the classroom myself so like i've i've been working at wimcat for a while um back when they were in the, the old building on uh, like fulton mm. and then when they moved to the new building i actually took a year off so i got to design my whole classroom and then not even use it <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and then i ended up coming back like the following year um and like that was like being able to you i did i came back the following year for like a year and then covid happened <laughs> or it, was, it wasn't even a full year it was like nine months and then covid happened <laughs> and it was like oh now we have to transition it to virtual and um <laughs> And so now being back in the studio is nice and like teaching what I do with teaching, like how to, you know, you know, recording tech, but also like with music production, you know, making beats, video and all of that, like students love it. Um, being able to like take that knowledge from what I have in my experience and giving it to somebody that young um, and seeing what they're going to do with it. To me, that's like, yeah, because like me growing up, I never had like a program where um you know that they teach me how to record audio or teach me like 
<laughs> what all these terms mean and also like you know how to you know if I need a whole orchestra behind me, how to do that in MIDI <laughs> and like, you know, how to get all of these ideas across. And then you could, you know, print off sheet music and bring that to musicians. Like if you want, yeah, they don't teach any, I've never learned any of that like in a classroom atmosphere. So it's just like, well, now I have to find something out, search on YouTube and find an expert. <laughs> like shadow some people <laughs> it's just they get to skip all of that and jump straight into the creative part which is cool yeah i i uh in my instagram story i shared this this kid who's like <laughs> he was like recreating I, at least i if, if he wasn't exactly recreating it it was like a similar vibe to like what sounded like a 90s hip-hop beat and this kid's like <laughs> you know you know like thinking about like the layering of the music and like he was he played a little drums bass keys self-producing it and then you know i'm sure one of his parents was like filming the process and edited into a clip but you know he's like he's like i think uh we need to add some uh some of these str some of the contact strings and he's and he sh shows him recording it and then <laughs> he, he takes a sip and it's like they zoom in uh, and it's like a sippy cup and i'm like how old is this kid <laughs> he's like making beats <laughs> and he, you know he's like he's like oh we'll we'll make a harmony track and then he looks at his dad like how do you spell harmony <laughs> he's like how do you think you spell harmony he's like i'm just gonna put an h <laughs> I'm like this kid is already making beats and he can't he's like he his feet don't touch the ground from this the studio seat <laughs> I'm just excited to see what like the kids do with music in general. Like, you know, we have, I think like music goes in cycles where mm -hmm. it's like, you know, there's like movements and there's anti-movements and they're like, there's genres that are popular and then everybody hates that genre, like disco. <laughs> and then, <laughs> you know, disco had, has, it's resurging now, like, <laughs> all the Daft Punk stuff is disco. It's just like, <laughs> that's disco. It's like, they're just taking disco records and rebranding re them. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's just like, you know, what are these kids gonna take? Like from growing up, like, I guess I had, like in my household, my mom listened to a lot of Stevie Wonder, stuff like that. Uh, Letter light -like orchestra stuff with a lot of like instrumentation. My dad was just more like funk, uh, yeah, like Parliament, that type of stuff. Uh, and then like me, when I started like, you know, listening to music heavily, it was like early '90s. Uh, for me, it was like Missy Elliott when like. 94 95 when she was doing stuff with swv mm. and then going from there to like her debut album like i was like oh this sounds so different than everything else like i want to learn how to do that and like make beats like that <laughs> and that was like yeah like the old genuine stuff so like all of that's still like in the music that i make today it's just like in the ether <laughs> right <laughs> it's it just like stevie wonder so it'd be like stevie a mix of like old school like black ground that was their record label at the time the black ground stuff this was like Aaliyah yeah and then it's like later like in the mid 90s or like going to the later 90s I dove more into just like hip-hop my favorite was like in that age was Busta Rhymes just because like oh, okay. he could do everything <laughs> he could <laughs> rap slow fast hype <laughs> could <laughs> Do whatever as a song with Janet Jackson, as a song with ODB, as a song with whatever. It's just like you could do it all. Uh, right. So that was like, and it was just like animated, and all these videos were super weird looking. And he had like fish eye, and <laughs> he wore crazy costumes. It was just like the whole sensory, like, had a good mix of like the visuals with the actual music. So it was, a, it was almost like a cartoon. Um, and then, like, Going through college, I got like into more serious music, just like 
oh, now I need something with more of a message. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, thought provoking stuff. And then now it's like, all of that kind of goes into the music we create. So it's like, I think the first like Lake Ritchie project was the Leah tape. And that was like, because that's like a Leah black ground, all of that <laughs> was like childhood, childhood stuff. So those first three like EPs were like titled after childhood crushes. <laughs> So it was like <laughs> Aaliyah, Yahura, which is like Star Trek, uh, and then uh, Aman. Hmm. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that was like childhood crushes turned into EP names. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad place to start with. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then that's like also like helped as far as like Aaliyah was like the sound we talked about that like background and stuff like that. Yeah, her are always like just like the music and Star Trek, just spacey stuff. I like space, so that was just like. Uh, and then um, Aman obviously like David Bowie, so that got me into liking David Bowie. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Good, good mix of, I, I, I think of like, cause <laughs> I feel like, you know, a lot of my early influences were, uh, my dad would play a lot of, um, you know, uh, blues or, and then, you know, stuff like stray cats type of rock and rolly blues, uh, Ray Charles, um, you know, Motown soul music, and then my mom would listen to a lot of, uh, you know, CCM and then like certain pop music. So she was like into the, yeah, the, the m- contemporary gospel and, you know, Mormon tabernacle choir and that kind of sound. And, yeah. and then, you know, I, I grew up going to Madison Square Church, which, you know, they would always try and have like, all right, Laura, Laura Carpenter's kind of leading the gospel thing. And that was after like, you know, Ken Reynolds, you know, decades ago was the MD there. And, um, uh, but they also would have like, oh, it's this, you know, middle-aged couple doing folk music <laughs> and they're playing a guitar. And, and, uh, so that was kind of the mix of like, oh, you're doing the, you know, if I was a kid in like a, a the children's worship band <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, playing, you know, for like third graders as a fifth grader and, uh, you know, hearing that kind of, you know, contemporary Christian music. But in that band, um, Jeffrey Niemeyer's younger brother, Matthew, uh, he he actually got me turned out of two things. One was seeing that you could use CDs as storage instead of just burning, you know, a, a, a listenable CD. Uh, and then through that, he would, you know, every time we, we would rehearse at his house, he would just send me home with like, you know, two CDs just packed full of songs. <laughs> so oh, yeah. I was like listening to like, you know, Dream Theater's like Octavarium and like, you know, Welcome to Buckethead Land. And then like, uh, you know, early Metallica and uh you know the racket tours just all sorts yeah. of like rock and metal and you know weird solo music and that was around the time too that like guitar hero started becoming popular among my friend groups so you know that influenced a little bit of like oh i like this song like let me check out the band um and you know all the while i'm studying like classical music <laughs> so i was like you know having to learn like rachmaninoff and bach and just getting that absorbed thing. Uh, and then high school is kind of around the time I started listening to jazz, just being in, you know, at the school jazz band and kind of having an interest in learning jazz. Um, and it, you know, it all kind of came together at Grand Valley, at least a starting point of like, I can study classical, I can play jazz. I have enough time to, you know, learn metal songs on guitar <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> like all of that 
combined with uh, getting exposed to contemporary classical music, um, which, you know, you got the minimalists like Steve Reich, you got the weird tape editing stuff. You have the like the super off the wall, like, you know, this is very conceptual and like just it's an idea. It's not it not even like a tune. It's just you know, abstract or the score is just this image is the score and you as the artist interpret it. And um, I feel like that chunk of like end of high school to like, you know, end of Grand Valley, those years were like just listening to all different kinds of music and, and then playing a lot of different, cause I was also like, you know, playing with Brad Fritcher and we did like the stuff at the death house and, yeah <laughs> all the craziness cool. there <laughs> with, the, yeah. with that like plain fuselage space heater that you had <laughs> yeah it was shoot flames out <laughs> it, was, it would scare people when we turned it on because it would be like it would shoot a bunch of flames out it's like a huge kerosene heater <laughs> like normally they're like half the size of that <laughs> this one was just like huge but it like it, it heated up that space but now those jazz shows, they were fun. It was just like super cold all the time, like through the winter in that space, <laughs> having to like, I felt bad for Brad because like, <laughs> can't really warm up his trumpet. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 well, and you know, I was just talking with Brad the other day of like, about you know, eventually him and his wife are going to move back to Michigan. And, you know, we had been talking kind of ever since the the speakeasy jams we had went away and then, you know, trying to do the similar vibes at, you know, Death House and some other half finished building on the West yeah. End. Um, the, you know, we're, we're like trying to figure out a way to, create that environment again um or you know whatever version of that environment yeah happens now and it happened to line up i'm i'm subbing in with the motivations on sunday and it's like a private event for this venue in traverse city that may is like she would i guess she's been talking about it for a couple years but it's almost like a co-op venue where like everyone that's attending this fundraiser all has like a stake and ownership and like financial okay. backing of this venue, um, which would be cool. Cause that's like, you know, it, it's less of like, you know, a well, some, somebody trying to take out a loan and then like make back that money on the back of a venue or yeah. selling to live nation. And then it just becomes a live nation venue or something. <laughs> yeah. I used to work for live nation. I know. <laughs> how they they're like there's a new venue popping up how do we buy it <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute this isn't part of the live nation family <laughs> yeah we're supposed to control everything <laughs> every venue every radio station tick ticket master <laughs> the whole lot yeah talk about antitrust laws like <laughs> what if you own all the culture <laughs> yeah let's own it all our band like even starting out um, I'm like a counterculture, I guess like we, we, we started out because we couldn't book any venues in the city. So we started doing shows with that and like other places where we would just rent it out and then just like throw parties and like make them cool. Like we'll change the space on the inside or like <laughs> do something weird. Uh, and it was, that became like the thing. So people were just like expecting that every time we did a show just like oh yeah you know there's something different like they're gonna do something <laughs> where like the space is all like it's different every time uh and then um actually got banned from some venues <laughs> oh. i got banned from the break break room it's not around anymore it was like a pull hall venue space oh yeah that's near where i live <laughs> And uh, I got banned. I, I'm I'm not gonna dive into that story because it's. <laughs> uh, but like a year later, they're like asking to book us because like those parties got bigger and bigger and bigger. 
and then we started going to different venues. Um, and like, as much as I like doing like, you know, like a normal bar venue, whatever, it's not the same as like how we were. Yeah, cause like, it was just more so the people were there for the party, were there for like, uh, like a bar venue is just kind of, you know, people are there to drink for the most part. <laughs> They'll sit there and like nod their head and like sip the whole uh, King of the Hill stick, yeah. <laughs> the whole shot, and then just be like, oh, yeah, your set was amazing. <laughs> it's just like, I couldn't tell. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's just <laughs> that, type of, that type of vibe. Um, and so, like, when I actually ended up doing a show at the Death House, and then uh, talked to the guys there, like Jonah and Lum, and they were just like, yeah, we're closing it down. And I was like, why? They're like, we can't afford it. But I was just like, I was a bar back at the time. <laughs> and I was like, well, how much is rent? They're like, they set a price. And I was like, I can afford that. <laughs> like, it was super, it was dirt cheap. I'm not going to tell you how much it cost, but it was dirt cheap. And I was just like. 30 bucks. And <laughs> a six, a six or, Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So they like go to the space and it's like, it was cool. Like the skate ramp was already built in there. Rich helped, Rich ended up building that. Um, it needed some work. Like we had to like redo the top of it, like all the cement. Um, and then like fix up some other stuff. But like that space was awesome, especially in the summertime. But then in the wintertime, there was no heat. <laughs> and then like the bathroom started breaking like after like the second show. <laughs> and then it was just like there was always like something wrong uh <laughs> we ended up tearing down like the whole bathroom rebuilt it repiped it all the way down to the sewer and it still it's like fuck it up so <laughs> that was like the <laughs> yeah the death house is like good and bad so it was good like learning experience but it was just str- the whole time it was stressful the, the whole time there was just like uh there's always something wrong there was always like shit going on uh it was also like an experiment in freedom so like we allowed people to do whatever they wanted inside um right. sort of <laughs> within, <laughs> <And reason. laughs> within reason but uh when people have that about a freedom people tend to like not necessarily abuse it, but just like take it overboard, abuse themselves more than like the space. Yep. Uh, and so like that became a problem. It is just like, well, what do we do about that? <laughs> and it's like, it's just going through like the time we had it, going through like all the conversations, the, like it was basically, it was me, uh, Sykes, Belvy, uh, Rich Cannon, were the main three and then rich left after like the first year so then it was me and sykes after that mm. with three people it was just like hard we had arguments between all three of us <laughs> just like our stuff to book uh like this and this and that like we didn't want you know a bunch of edm shows i was trying to like bring more music to the space like doing the jazz stuff uh the jazz night like we still wanted it to like keep its original format of like being a punk venue. Mm-hmm. But then like all the, the punk scene was like split. So it was like, there was like a lot of these newer punk bands like like Soji, like Ape Not Kill Ape that like the older punks didn't like. So we would book them for shows and then the older punks would get pissed and be like, <laughs> Yeah, why aren't you booking our bands? <laughs> and then it's like, well, now we'll book your bands. And there's like, whatever. Just <laughs> it was a whole, <laughs> yeah, it was just like, and there, there was one funny story though. So, like, we had for like one month, did like three EDM shows on like a Saturday, um, like back to back to back. And so, like, the fourth show that month was like, it was the bitters. I don't know if you know the bitters. Yeah, uh, yep. Uh, yeah, Jeff's band. <laughs> and this party bus shows up <laughs> with a bunch of like EDM kids. And I don't know, there was like this, but there was this uh, punk band. They were super dope. They were like, I think they were from 
like Youngstown, Ohio. Mm. And then it was another punk band from Chicago that was rocking that night. Um, and they were on, they were like heavy and loud, like you can hear it down the block. So I'm like, they had to hear that when they were hopping out of this party bus. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like a ten dollar <laughs> ticket. It's so like all these people. It was like forty. Uh, it's probably like forty of them paid to get in. <laughs> and they're there, and they're like with the light up shoes and all of that. Like the whole fucking night, they're there to rave. Oh, uh, <laughs> and they're like, "What is this?" <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, it's a punk show." And then this like girl tries to go and get her money back from Jeff, <laughs> and like he flips the table out on her. And like she comes running, like you can't do this as an establishment. Like we're never ever coming back here. Like I'm like it's a punk show. What the, what the fuck did you expect? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like the fair just gotta <laughs> like this is it's just like you you can hear the music from outside. You should have known. Like this is just <laughs> I don't know. It's like words you, mean things. <laughs> yeah, like words mean things. Use your ears. If you don't like a genre, don't like come to the show, <laughs> or just like ask the person that what's going on, you know, tonight. It's just I don't know. It's just a uh, normal music venue where they could just complain to us, and we were just like, "No, fuck you, <laughs> you can leave." <laughs> like, like wait, it's like, <laughs> it is like I'm t- not telling. I'm telling my friends to never come here. It's just like. <laughs> thank you <laughs> we, we don't want you here like it's just there was a lot of stuff like our format was just like we wanted more shows that like uh for genres that d- didn't normally get booked so right. like i say adm shows but we didn't have a lot of EDM shows we had like the deep house like electro some jungle shows uh so it was more so like just genres of electronic music that don't normally get, you know, play. Um, and same thing, like hip hop shows. We had like rap battles there. We had like, uh, yeah, jazz stuff, punk for the most part. Like they, like as we started getting popular, um, a lot of people would ask, but you know, at the death house, um, but if it was like somebody that could book at like the pyramid scheme or somebody that could book at the intersection or wherever, it was just like, we don't want them just because like you can book there. <laughs> you could book, you know, <laughs> these are, these are for the kids that can't get those spots. You know, these are for the people that can't, you know, they don't have the resources and know the right people to get into those spots. Right. So like you guys have your own lane, you guys can make your own money and do that. Like this is, and I think that like, helped helped a lot of people's careers especially like in hip-hop like showing like younger hip-hop artists that you can actually make money doing <laughs> like right you know music and actually <laughs> like the format and like how to like actually do it uh, and yeah that that i have like a bunch of artists to this day it was like yeah you know you gave me my start or like you showed me how to like actually make money <laughs> doing music um because like most venues like they're you have to negotiate how much you're gonna get get paid yep (laughs) and a lot of people are terrible at negotiating yes like (laughs) it's a lot of artists like they just love to play and like it's like that's great but like you have to know your worth (laughs) or else like venues are going to take advantage of yep or like any any promoters whatever just that's just the name of the game. It's just like, well, you know, I can get so-and-so for $50. You're going to get so-and-so for $50. Or like, you know, if there's somebody that should be getting like $1,000 a show, like they have the talent to book $1,000, to ask for $1,000 a show. If they don't ask for it, they're never going to get it. Right. And then it's like, you have to, yeah, know your own worth. And it's like, there's other artists that like, you know, ask for eight hundred dollars and then like don't do anything. <laughs> right. It's just like, you know, they're just so there's a give and take. But I think for most like for most artists, there's no like nobody teaches them how to negotiate. <laughs> like nobody teaches them like how to actually write up a contract and like 
say, hey, you know, this is what I, <laughs> this is what I could do. This is what I need to get paid. This is what I need to perform. <laughs> right. <That's it>. Like, <laughs> you'd be a great child. And I can bring this. And like, yeah. Um, so that's been like, I've been trying to teach that in my class, but we haven't got, like, this is our first year back in person full right. time. So like, uh, we're not doing, like normally I would do a whole full year, like programming where it's like, first semester is more so like uh you know learning the tools how to record how to you know produce how to do this how to do that and then like the second semester is like now we're going to put together a performance or a show or something and we're like <laughs> we have community partners we could partner with whoever you know pyramid scheme listening room whatever and they'll do a show we like think we did Creston brewery before covid yeah um they did a show down there uh our students did a show down there and like that i want to get back into doing stuff like that but it's like now it's more so just like semester at a time so it's like let's see what i could do with this semester i might have like all totally new students the next semester um so i just don't know but that was like the cool part about covid everybody learned to pivot and adapt <laughs> quicker and quickly <laughs> so like now it's like and i can like conversate with my students like via you know google classroom or like zoom or whatever even outside of the class um that's been like cool so i can just be like hey if you want to learn more about this subject i can set up a zoom meeting do you want to come in the day and work on some stuff at LMCAT? Because like right now we're doing Monday and Monday and Wednesday for the main core classes. And I teach like uh, we have like other stuff that I teach. Uh, in the morning we have like a, a partnership with Harrison Park uh, and things with you prep. So like regardless of all of that, uh, it's just like the main programming. There's like days like a Tuesday and Thursday where like after school the building's open. And I'm like you could just ask <laughs> like if you're passionate about like the music and all of that just ask the staff here and they can like set up stuff for you but right. it's having to ask that's hard for like artists in general same thing with like having to ask for like your pay rate or having to ask like can i use this space at times this not the classroom right um, i think it's just like getting past that i try to teach like outside of like, this is the stuff, like music and all of that, just like creative confidence and like being able to like walk into a room full of people. Cause I'm like an introvert at heart, like, but I can walk into a room full of people and like maneuver um, and be able to like talk to people and demand like what I want or what I need or, you know, <laughs> this is, you know, for a band, like, <laughs> This is what we need. This is what we want. Yeah, it's just trying to teach that. And like in high school, all these kids are awkward. They're just <laughs> <laughs> like if you remember, you're like you're just you're coming into yourself. So like mm -hmm. self conscious about like everything. Uh, yep. Especially when it comes to like adults. Like <laughs> kids are like they're self conscious amongst themselves, definitely. But then like around adults they were more self-conscious it's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> um especially if there's more than one adult in like the classroom or more than one adult it's like sometimes like you know i have other adults come in and they're just like they're kind of clam up i'm just like you don't have to be you don't have to do this around these people. like it's creating that environment of being safe and like <laughs> this is a space where you can be yourself be outspoken Yep. Like, you know, get your ideas across and then like give other people the space to get their ideas across. Um, Cause it works both ways. It's like, and that's like outside of like teaching the technical aspects of music and music production and all of that. Like that's the main thing I want to get across in my class. It's just like, <laughs> be confident enough to like, <laughs> even if you don't go into music, you never do music again for the rest of your life. At least you learn like some life skills. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Some, some life skills. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's that's a great like kind of umbrella term for I don't know the, this whole discussion, your whole background, and creative confidence. You know, like nobody yeah. had to tell you like, oh yeah, you're gonna run a punk house or you're gonna r- be in a sound company. Like you just saw the things you wanted to do and you got involved in something that even if it was temporary, you you picked up a skill or you know, added it to your toolbox and built something else with it. And I think that's a, a great yeah. thing for, uh, you know, all sorts of artists to, to remember, especially like, yeah, as you're saying, a- adapting post COVID, like so many people learned streaming for the first time, or they used, you know, their phone for anything other than social media or texting. Like they figured out how to, you know, record video, maybe even edit video yeah. and, um, yeah, and I think this was a great uh, discussion <laughs> overall. <laughs> Just to hear more yeah. about the underground, some of the underground stuff that I didn't know, and so you know, some of the history of you know working in this city. So uh, yeah, yeah, appreciate. No, it was it was great. Like yeah, I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> I enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, no, it was it was great. Uh, where should people? You know, like where do you want to steer people online to find out what you do, like a website or socials or any of that? <laughs> yeah, socials. So like, uh, I think it's Lake Creative Band on Facebook. It's also Lake Creative Band uh, it's IG. Uh, at me personally, it's just Dante Cope. D A N T E C O P E. So, like, at Dante Cope, if you want to do Twitter or Instagram or, like, yeah, Facebook. You can just search at Dante Cope on Facebook and actually, like, for your teeth, I think will pop up. Oh, um, nice. So, that is, yeah, if you want to get the music there or, like, creative. Hang on, I got to spell it out because a lot of people don't know how to say this or pronounce this. <laughs> I keep, like, glossing over it. So, it's L E S. C R E A T I F. You can search that on Spotify, whatever social media is, and all of that. So, not less creative because we get that at every show we've performed. <laughs> Up next, less creative. Less creative. <laughs> it's like, it's, yeah, it's. <laughs> I'll even like tell tell them like before the show, like slay creative. It's French. I know. I know. It's like Detroit. <laughs> it's like, <Yep. laughs> you know, that's a French word. You yeah. Could, you could, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. I'm sure folks will check out all the things you do. And maybe some people listening have kids into the arts and might want to, you know, see about getting into Wimcat or other opportunities like that. So, yep. yeah. Wimcat, Wimcat.org, uh, W M C A T. Org. That's uh, the website. Team programs. Is the, click that link. And everything's in that. Awesome. And folks will be able to check stuff. I'll put links in descriptions and stuff. So I'm pointing yep. down. And we have... I don't know where they are on Spotify. Here. <laughs> yeah, they won't see it visually. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we're re- releasing. I don't know when this episode's going to come out, but we're releasing new music on Halloween. Oh, nice. This should be up uh, tomorrow, so okay. <laughs> playing playing it close to the chest. <laughs> awesome! So new music on Halloween. Awesome! <laughs> well, cool. Follow this link. Whatever yeah. for that Any link. of the links. <laughs> awesome! Cool. Yeah, I'm sure we'll run into each other soon this fall, and uh, yeah. yeah, we are playing a show together. Oh, uh, is that the... 30th. The... Oh, that's the one I can't believe. Uh, oh, <laughs> never mind then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sh- sh- yeah. The, I have uh, Earth Radio and Flex Festival are doing a Halloween bash. <laughs> so uh, we're in the ski game that night. <laughs> but at, but at some point we'll do what we recorded. <laughs> and, and more. <laughs> but, awesome. Yeah. Well, enjoy the rest of your evening. Good talk, too. Um, yeah. Thanks, everyone, for checking out today's episode. 
that was a great chat. It was great to hear a lot more about the underground and DIY scenes uh, from Brandon's perspective, um, doing a lot of different jobs in West Michigan. And hopefully you learned something about being an artist or being confident in whatever you do, being flexible and creative in approaches to different things. Uh, it's always fun to hear other people's perspective and experiences uh, in these types of discussions. So, remember, you can support on patreon.com slash dutchersnedeker. You can check out my website, dutchersnedeker.com, for all the other things I'm doing. And you can always share and post and like, subscribe, all the, all the things, all the buzzwords, all the algorithmic feeding things. You can do that to help push this out to the ether. So, we'll catch you next week for another episode of Mitten Backstage. Take care.